All right, then let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 tonight. And uh, we're going to we're gonna read um, verse 19, and that's it for tonight. So I knew... Uh, I knew a, a pastor here in Southern Illinois, actually just passed away uh, last year, but a really good friend of our family, and he always told this story. Uh, he was a pastor down in in the very tip of Illinois, in Alexander uh, in Pulaski County, and man, there are some, there are some um, hollers and hills back up in there. Uh, where where sometimes people don't come out for a while, it seems. And, and there was one family in particular, so he went to this church, and, and there were some people who who were very, very poor and and um, kind of, um, you know, just a, if you're around West Frankfurt, it would be sort of a wild bill sort of situation, except not quite as, not quite as uh, you know, iconic as he is. But anyway, the, this family, they, all the kids had a lisp, a really strong lisp, and um, they came to the, when when he came to the church, and they were going to go down in the basement and and have you know a, a food fellowship, and because that's what fellowship means at a Baptist church, and and these people you know in their late teens, early twenties kind of age, I think, they said, oh no, we ain't going down there, Pastor Johnny. There there there's dirty dust down there. They ain't going down there. There's dirty dust, and he trying to figure out what in the world they were saying. He said, what is it? Do- do- I ain't going down in that basement. There's a dirty dose down there. And so finally he figured out what they were saying was Holy Ghost. And they don't want no part of any ghost. I don't, I don't, they, you don't fool around with stuff like that, I guess. And so um, he, you know, every anytime anybody said Holy Ghost, he'd start laughing. Said, oh, I ain't going down there. There's some dirty dose down there. I ain't going down there. So tonight we're going to talk about the dirty ghost. We're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about the holy the Holy Spirit. That's what most people call it today, rather than rather than Holy Ghost. And I think that's probably that's probably good. So um, we're talking about the the Spirit of God tonight in in First Thessalonians chapter five, verse nineteen. Four words for our text tonight: Don't stifle the Spirit. Don't stifle. The spirit, or other translations will say, "Don't quench, or don't try to extinguish, or suppress the spirit." So, before we jump into what in the world does that mean, and how do we obey that and not do it, I, I always want to, you know, just make sure that that we're on the same page, and not want to assume that everybody just knows, you know, all the stuff that that you know we would think we do about the Holy Spirit. And so let's do a little Holy Spirit 101 here at the beginning and, and just talk real briefly about who he is and, and the role that he plays in our life. So here's the first thing, first order of business. He is the, the third person of the Trinity, but he's third in order, not in importance. The, the Trinity, the, the order that you know we say that we're going to baptize people in, that Jesus commanded us to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, that is um, the order that he said them in. That is not a ranking of importance. God is one and yet three in one. That's the doctrine of the Trinity. And, and the third one is still God. He's still every bit as important. God wouldn't be fully God if there wasn't this third person of the Trinity. And he is absolutely important, extremely important, like all three persons of the Trinity are. And yet, often, I heard someone say this one time, and I don't know where it was, but they said, if, if you were to go into, aside from you know, the, the charismatic Pentecostal kind of churches, if you were to go in the average evangelical church in, in the United States and just listen, you would, you would think that the, the Trinity was the Father, the Son, and the Holy Bible, rather than the Holy Spirit. And I get where they're coming from because we absolutely we should place such a high, a, a high honor and high importance on the Word of God, but that is not a replacement for the Spirit of God working among us. One, one lady said, I, "I'd rather people call me a Pentecostal and be wrong than them call me a dead Baptist and be right." And to that I say, Amen. He's third in order but not third in importance. 
John John Newton was a was a a um, well he was a slave trader first and then God changed his heart saved his soul and he became an abolitionist in in England and was a a pastor and wrote a famous song a lot of them but one of them in particular you might know Amazing Grace and here's what he wrote in the 1700s is it really true that the that which with the early church so depended on for success the leadership of the Spirit has become irrelevant for us today? Do we think we're that advanced, you know, that, that we don't need the same Spirit that, that they absolutely depended on? And that's a man from the 1700s that's sounding the alarm then. And he's not, you know, he's not some modern TV evangelist with perfectly coiffed hair. I mean, here's a picture of him. Okay, so he does have the coiffed hair a little bit, but but you you get the point. He's all the way back then, kind of sounding the same alarm, going like, we need to get back to a reliance and and a honoring and a revering and a not quenching of the spirit. So the spirit's third in order. He is not third in importance. The second thing would be he is both glorious and mysterious because he's a spirit. He's hard for us to describe. I mean, how do you describe a spirit? So the, it's hard for us to get our minds around it and to try to describe him. That's why in the Bible, often you see him, when you see the spirit talked about, there's metaphors. The most common ones in the New Testament are wind, water, and fire. Think about those things. Wind, water, and fire. All of them are powerful. All of them are absolutely essential to our lives, and all of them are unpredictable. Water is unpredictable. You ever seen when a, a flood, a, a dam bursts and there's a flood or, or a tsunami? Water is unpredictable. Fire is unpredictable, and wind is unpredictable. Jesus actually said that in John 3. The wind blows where it pleases, and you hear the sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it's going, and so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. I'm actually part of the Skywarn weather spotting program for the Weather Service. It's basically just this um, volunteer program for everyday citizens where they train and, and try to learn and get certified to be able to look at the sky and look at radar, etc., but mainly look at the sky and, and understand what's going on and accu- accurately report it to the Weather Service, in particular when there's a severe, a severe weather outbreak. And one of the things I've learned since I've been doing that the last couple of years is, is that besides the fact that you know meteorologists are like the nerdiest of all categories of nerds I've ever seen, they're incredibly humble. Even though this is their profession that they've spent, you know, decades of their lives trying to study. They are humble in, in, in admitting how much we still don't know about the weather and forecasting. We've got models, supercomputers working on it, and we still, it's really hard, really difficult to, to know where the wind's coming from and where it's going, where it's going to blow. And Jesus said the same thing is true for the spirit. He's like the wind. He's like water. He's like fire. He wants to intensify the heat of his presence in our own hearts and in our own lives and in our families and in our our churches. The the third thing that I would say in sort of Holy Spirit 101 is kind of repeating what I said before, but with a different focus. He's a person. He's the the third person of the Trinity in order, not in importance, but he is a person with a capital P. He's not an it. Sometimes you'll hear people talking about the Holy Spirit as it. It's not it. It's he, he, him. He's a person. He's not a force. It's easy to think about like, oh, I just feel the Spirit. And you know, you'll even non-believers talking that same kind of way. I just feel this sort of presence. I feel the, you know, I feel this peace wash over me, you know, all this kind of stuff. No, no. He is... All, all, he may do all those things. You may feel all those things in his presence, but that is not who he is. That's a that's a you know an outflowing of who he is. He is a person, unique and spectacular and glorious, all in himself. He's not a force. He's not a power. He's not you know a, a feeling. He is a person, and that's going to be important here in a little bit. The the fourth thing would be just that he is absolutely essential to living the Christian life. And 
That's actually what Jesus said. Look at John 16. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away. Because if I don't, the advocate won't come. And if I do go away, then I will send him to you. So Jesus knew that he was essential. And he said that we would be better off this way. That he would go and that he would send the comforter, the advocate, the Holy Spirit. So what, what role does he play in our lives? Well, here's just a few of them from God's word. He, he plays the role of counselor. In fact, that's a name, counselor or teacher. And he is our reminder. Look at John 14, just a, a couple of chapters where, from where we just were. But the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have told you. So we're supposed to make disciples uh, of Jesus Christ, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teach them to observe everything that I have commanded you. That's what Jesus said. The good news is we don't have to do that alone. We've got the authority of Jesus. We've got the Father watching over us, and we've got the Spirit who is also going to be reminding those people and reminding us of everything that Jesus has told us. And I'll tell you what, for an ADHD mind that, that forgets things very easily, that's just an extra little bit of encouragement. The, uh, that's a promise to cling on to that he will remind me. That's a, a role that the Spirit plays. He, he's also our guide, our guide guide to truth. John 16 again, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He's our guide into truth and by definition away from falsehood. He's our he's our guide away from temptation. He's our guide just in everyday life. So often we think of the Christian life as like a bunch of things you got to learn and then a bunch of things you got to do. And you do need to do both of those things, but that's not primarily what it is. What it primarily is, is learning to follow the guidance of the Spirit, speaking through His Word, speaking through His people, speaking to you in, in that still, small voice. And when the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth, Jesus said. Romans chapter 8 says is that He is the one who assures us of our standing with God, that we are his children. Romans 8, 15, so that you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father, for his spirit, Holy Spirit, joins with our spirit to affirm that we are indeed God's children. So Jesus claimed that having the spirit in us is better than having Jesus himself beside us. Now, I want you to be honest for a second. Is that your experience? Is your experience with the Holy Spirit, you're walking with him day by day, is, 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 does it make it seem like that statement is true? It's better to have the Spirit inside of you than Jesus actually physically next to you? I don't, know how, I don't even know how I would answer that question because I would love to have Jesus standing next to me. And yet you think about it, another person physically here, that's one thing, and that would be amazing. We're looking forward to that day, but the Spirit's here all the time, no matter what. I so desperately want the answer. My, the answer for me and the answer for you to that question to be a resounding yes. Oh, yes, that rings true for me. I don't know what I would do if I didn't have the Spirit. So then, so then what's it mean, getting back to the text for tonight, what's it mean to stifle the Spirit? What's it mean to quench? What's it mean to grieve the Spirit of God? I, I use that word grieve because uh, another key passage that talks about the same kind of thing is Ephesians 4, where it says, And don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. You were sealed by him for the day of redemption. So we already established the fact that he is a person. And because he's a person, that means he can be grieved. He can be grieved. We can stifle our relationship. You ever been in a relationship with someone and then all of a sudden they tried to quench that relationship? Maybe it was a boyfriend or a girlfriend or, or a, a co-worker that, you know, was your best buddy when you first got there. And then all of a sudden, um, maybe when you're up for the same promotion or they're trying to hobnob with somebody who doesn't like you. And all of a sudden that relationship gets stifled. It gets quenched. 
they grieve you. And the Holy Spirit, who lives inside of every single believer, indwelt us so that we are the temples where he dwells. That spirit is grieved often, I think, by our, by our actions. It's serious business when we talk about grieving the third person of the Trinity. There, it's easy to, to not think of, you know, you think of God the Father as being the one, the judge, and I think that's right to kind of say like, oh, you got to, you know, I, I wouldn't want to, to sin against the Father. And you look at the cross and you go, I, I don't want to sin against Jesus because my sin put him there. But what about the Spirit sinning against him? Because he's with you all the time. All the time. He heard what you said the other day. He was there. He saw the attitude that you had the other day. He saw when I, you know, did X, Y, or Z, because he sees it all. He's there for it all. So how, how do we quench the Spirit? What are some of the ways that we see in, in God's Word that we can quench the Spirit? Well, this is, this is going to next week, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. But immediately in this context, you see that it's despising prophecy. So again, we'll talk about this more next week, but we should be walking through life expecting to hear from the Spirit, expecting Him to speak to us, primarily through His Word, and also through other people. And that has the potential for a lot of abuse, and it has been abused over the years. We've all seen it. And so it's easy to become cynical and jaded and just write it all off and despise it all. And this text, the next verse, the the rest of this sentence says, "Don't, don't stifle the spirit. Don't despise prophecies. So we'll talk more about that uh, coming up. The second thing I would say is the way that we despise, the way that we quench him is by neglecting the gifts that he has given us. We've all been given spiritual gifts. And, and um, in, in First and Second Timothy, you see this in particular uh, when, when Timothy is talking to Paul about the special and unique gift of the Spirit that he's been given. It says, Do not neglect the spiritual gift you received through the prophecy spoken over you when the elders of the church laid their hands on you. So he's saying, Timothy, don't neglect this gift, the spiritual gift that you have been given. And then, so that's the first book, the first letter to Timothy. Then you, you go to the second one, chapter 1, verse 6. It says, This is why I remind you. So Paul's doing the same thing. That, that the Spirit does, reminding. This is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. So maybe you remember, if you've been with us for a long time, back when we were going through First Peter, there was a, a section on spiritual gifts there. And, and one of the things we talked about is that when, when you're given a spiritual gift, it's not like the Spirit says, okay, like you're a Christian now, here's your gift, and then drops it in your lap and and leaves. That's not what it is at all. What it is is a special manifestation of the Spirit in your life for the good of the church and for the the sake of of the mission of the gospel um, going to the ends of the earth. It's a, it's a, a special, unique way that God has gifted you and designed you and wired you so that, so that he can work through you. And so to neglect that is to neglect him. To, to stifle that is to stifle, by definition, the work that he's trying to do in you. And so Paul's saying to Timothy and to us, don't neglect the spiritual gifts that you have received. Don't neglect. Neglecting would be the, the same as stifling, quenching the spirit and grieving the Spirit. I wonder, even in my own life, and I, I wonder for you, what the Spirit might have done, what amazing things we might have seen accomplished, what lives might have been changed, the joy that we might have experienced ourselves, all those times when we feel His nudging to do something that we're gifted to do, and going, ah, I don't know. I don't know if I want to today. I don't know. I'm too tired. I'm, you know, I'm whatever, whatever our excuse was for that, 
for that day or for that year. Don't neglect the gifts that he's given you and stifle his work in you. Another thing would be suppressing emotions in worship. This is probably what most people think of. If you've heard sermons before about or heard pastors say in, in passing about not quenching the spirit, generally they're talking about be free in your worship. You know, raise the hand, shout, you know, maybe dance a little bit if you're good at it. I don't know. Uh, some people shouldn't dance. What, whatever the case is, you know, be, be expressive in your worship. Don't try to suppress that emotion. I, I said this Friday night, when last Friday, when we, on, in our Good Friday service, it's kind of at the beginning. I said, if there's, any, if there's ever a night where you should be emotional, this would be it. When we think about the sacrifice that was made for our redemption. But that's really true all the time. And you might be one of these people, or, or you might know people that would say like, well, that, that's fine, but that's for me in private. I don't, I don't like to, you know, I don't like to cry in front of people. I don't, I don't like to, you know, I don't want to be a distraction, so I, I, don't, I don't think I'll ever raise my hand or anything. Listen, if, you, if you're worried about that, sit in the back, because then you, you don't have to worry about it. There ain't nobody behind you to be, they won't know what you're doing or not. So, I just told Baptists to sit in the back. The whole, the whole thing's going to tip over now. Um, listen, if that's you, I, I love you, but let me just speak real honestly. You are caring way too much about what people think and not nearly enough about following the lead of the Spirit in those moments. And even worse, heaven forbid that we would ever be the people who try to squelch the emotions of others because we're uncomfortable with it ourselves. Listen, we do not need your church, our church, we don't need more members in the bucket brigade, the cold water committee. You know, this just goes pour, pour stuff on anytime the spirit starts to light a flame and get it, you know, get it going. Um, it's like, oh, we can't, we can't have that. Got to keep it under control. We don't, you know, we don't want to get a wildfire. Listen, I want a wildfire of the Spirit's work in our lives and our churches. Uh, I want to see revival spread across the land where, where there's wildfires that take up entire states of the Holy Spirit. Don't suppress. If you love someone, I mean, you remember the, the think back to the time where you, exp where you expressed the most love that you ever had. Maybe it's your wedding or, or maybe probably more likely actually where you, where you got engaged, where you're, where you're asking someone or, uh, or, you know, accepting, hopefully the, 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 the offer of spending the rest of our lives together. In that moment, you're not thinking about how are other people going to see this? How, how, are, how do I look? How do I, you know, how am I expressing myself? No, you're just overcome with love. And this is a relationship with a person, with a capital P person, but still a person. So, so then how do we obey this text? Let's wrap it up for tonight. How do we not stifle the Spirit? Well, here, here's just a, a few ways that I think we can. First of all, expect him to speak. Expect him to speak to you. Remember, remember two weeks ago, you can go back and look at the, the message if you want to, these, these three verses immediately preceding this, it says that God wants, what we said that week was God wants to be close to me. And if I had to go back and do it over again, I would say the Spirit wants to be close to me. This, this verse, don't stifle the Spirit, it obviously leads into, and don't despise prophecies. We talked about that. But it also connects to the verses previous. It's like it's the fourth thing there in that list. It says to rejoice always, to pray constantly, to give thanks in everything. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So don't quench the Spirit's work in your life. Expect him, expect to be hearing from him and to be in communication with him day by day by day. Rejoice, pray constantly. That's happening. And the only way that it can happen is through the Spirit's work. And in everything, give thanks. You know who will remind you? <coughs> Excuse me, <coughs> allergy season. You know who will remind you? 
of all of the things that you have to be thankful for? Yeah, the dirty dose, the Holy Spirit. Number two, how do we do this? Well, we, are, we just read the verse, fan the flame, fan the flame. Paul said, I, I remind you, I'm reminding you, Timothy, I told you the first time, I'm going to tell you again, fan into flame the spiritual gift that God gave you. Listen, you need to develop, I need to develop, we have to have a sense of in our own lives, and this is different, there are some similarities, but it's different for every person, what fuels your fire and what douses it? What is the fuel that when you put that fuel into your life and the work of the Spirit in your heart, all of a sudden, you know, you see the flame just explode? Do more of that. And what are the things where, where all of a sudden you see the flame just shrink, 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 shrink down until there's just a, a bed of coals there? Don't do those things. This is, this is about as practical as it gets. Fan the flame and don't do the things that tend to make your fire smaller. The Holy Spirit's a fire, and he wants to illuminate our hearts. And, and remember the, 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 uh, the two men on the road to Emmaus? What did they say? Didn't our hearts burn within us? Yes, because they had heard the, the words from Jesus, and they were hearing from the Spirit. Do whatever you can, within biblical parameters, of course, to intensify the heat of his presence in your life. Pour some godly gasoline on that fire and warm up to its heat. Third thing, this is, this is real simple. This is sort of my own sort of uh, little thing, because you ever have this moment where, or many moments where you go like, I think that's the Spirit leading me? But I'm not 100% sure. It might be just me. It might be that, you know, I had some, you know, bad pizza last night and, like, I didn't sleep well and, like, things are, uh, I'm just in my own head. Spirit, is that, is that you? You know, that kind of moment? Here, here's what I'd say, the third thing. Default to yes. Default to yes. Especially, if, I'm, I'm not talking, like, major life decisions, you know. I, I'm talking about just everyday stuff. If you feel the Spirit leading if you if you think that you feel the spirit leading somewhere, go, <laughs> do it. If you say in that moment, is that you? I can't tell if that's you, but I'm going to say yes, just in case. Even if it wasn't him, don't you think he'd be pleased with that attitude? I think he is. I think he is. And I wouldn't want to miss out on anything that he's... He's guiding me into or guiding me out of because heaven knows if he says, go here, go there. You know, I used the example this morning. Am I going to go to McCord's or Kroger here in West Frankfurt? Like, that's, a silly, that's just a silly example, but it's one of those things where, like, maybe there's a car accident over here and just the guidance of the Spirit just leading you go, like, I don't know if that's you, but I'm just going to say yes. The same thing's true when you're sharing the gospel with somebody, when you're, when you're going, like happened here this morning, I don't have to go into the details, but it happened here, right here on this stage that I'm at this morning, where one person said, can I just give you a hug? I just feel like I need to give you a hug. And I said afterwards, that was the right thing to do. That was the right thing to do. You follow the Spirit's leading. Even if, even if you don't know that it is for sure, it probably is. You're his child. Follow. Default to yes. Here's the fourth thing, last thing. Develop an awareness of his presence. Try to develop this sense of an awareness of his presence. I've told you before, Jonathan Edwards' journals had a, a, uh, a, a number at the top, and it was the amount of the percentage of time that he thought during that day that he had been aware of God's presence. What would your, what would your number look like? Wherever you go, you ever heard this phrase, wherever you go, there you are. Yep, that's right. Wherever you go, there you are. And if you are a child of God, there he is with you. You ever feel alone in the world? Even in a crowd, you can feel alone. For a Christian, for those who are indwelt with the Spirit, listen, that feeling, 
that you have of being alone is always an illusion. It's never true because you were never truly alone because you're indwelt with the Spirit of God. People say, well, I'm just so busy. I'm so busy. I don't like, when I think about praying and reading the Bible and going to church and serving and going on mission trips. And like, yeah, I'm just so busy. I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I can make that switch. Well, you should do all those things, and we can talk about that. But I understand we have busy lives. But he's with you in all of that busyness. Do you realize that? In all of your running around, taking the kids here and there, picking them up from school, taking them to ball practice and going to work and all of it, all the stuff that we do, all of the busyness, frenetic pace of our lives, he's there in the middle of it. You don't have to like have this. I mean, you should have this special time, but that's not the only time. He's with you all the time. If you're going to pray constantly, that means this constant communication with the Spirit, through the Spirit, to the Son and the Father. We, we sing this song sometimes, All I Have is Christ. In the second verse, it says this, Now, Lord, I would be yours alone and live, listen to this, and live so all might see the strength to follow your commands could never come from me. That's such a great line. I want to live in such a way that people who look at my life, they go, like, that has to come from somewhere else. There is a power that... that that has to be different from him because no person could, could be that way. Uh, Francis Chan wrote a, a great book on, on the Holy Spirit called The Forgotten God. And, and he, he, he said this in there, I don't want my life to be explainable without the Holy Spirit. I want people to look at my life and know that I couldn't be doing this by my own power. Amen. I want the same thing for me, and I want the same thing. For you. If if you can, would you just bow your head with me for just a second? You, if you, you don't want to, you don't have to, but there's nothing magical about it. It's just more of just getting into the zone, Get, getting alone with just you and Him. By Him, I mean the Holy Spirit tonight. I wonder if the Spirit might have brought to mind some places tonight where where you might have you might have been quenching his work in you, where you might have been grieving him because he wants so much more for you. Maybe it's unconfessed sin. Maybe it's just a general attitude of life. Maybe you've just been neglecting. There's not been much rejoicing or praying or thankfulness in your life lately. Maybe you've never surrendered your life to him at all, and you don't don't have any experience of, of him, but you want to. Just here, I think for a lot of us, this is what probably, even in my own heart, what I felt this week. Just hear him simply saying, I miss you. Come back. I want to be in fellowship with you again. This is a relationship. We're talking about a person. And so answer, answer him tonight. I miss you too. I'm sorry for ignoring you so long. The other good news for us tonight is that the Spirit is never going to reveal these kind of things, show us where we've been dousing the fire, show us where we've been grieving Him, hurting Him. He will never reveal those to us and then not empower us for moving past it, for moving forward, for 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 righteousness. How cruel would he be if he did that? No. Everywhere he leads, every conviction of sin is an invitation to something better. Every invitation is an invitation. Every, every time you feel his guidance, every time you feel him saying, come back, come back, it's an invitation for you to live more of the abundant life that Jesus pur- purchased for you on the cross. Listen, this is not about shame. He doesn't use shame. No, he's the comforter, not the condemner. He's going to remind you that you are a child of God, and you can cry out, Abba, Father. And his confrontation of you, of your sin, is an invitation for forgiveness and for new life and for a relationship that's been restored. A couple weeks ago, when last time we were in 1 Thessalonians, We ended with this verse from Isaiah 42 that said, A bruised reed 
he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. When you're at your weakest, when you're at your worst, he says, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to break this bruised person, this bruised reed. And a faintly burning wick, a candle that's just about to go out, said, I'm not going to quench that. I'm going to allow my spirit to work and fan that flame again. So the Holy Spirit has promised not to quench us. The goal, the, the point for tonight is that we would do the same and not quench him. We're going to end with this song tonight. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. And in particular, I want you to pay attention to the bridge here. Because it really is the heart of this. Don't quench the spirit. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness as we walk day by day. Always rejoicing. Never, never um, not praying. Always in constant communication with him. Giving thanks in everything because this is his will for us, and we don't want to quench his work. We don't want to stifle the spirit in our lives. He's not going to quench us. Let's recommit tonight not to quench him. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place. Let's just pray right now. Father, I pray that wherever my brother or sister is watching this right now, that you would flood that place, and most importantly, flood their heart and fill the atmosphere of their minds and their lives. Because your glory, Lord, it's what our hearts are longing for. Our hearts long to see your glory. And God, I pray that you would make us long even more. We thirst for you. And I pray that you would make us even more thirsty. Make us desperate to feel the power of of your spirit among us. Your glory, Lord, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, overwhelmed by your goodness. God, I pray that this would be true in every heart and every life tonight. In Jesus' name and for his glory, amen.